All right, it's a pleasure to uh, open this uh, fifth day of the first Zoom version of uh, Amplitudes. And we're going to start with a talk by uh, Henrik Johansson on uh, mass of n equals one, super Yang Mills amplitudes, and the Suzy decomposition. Thank you, David. Um, and <laughs> like previous speakers, I should also thank the organizers for putting this together. Uh, it's great that we can meet online in these times, so, uh, especially thanks to Anastasia. All right, so I will talk about some uh, ongoing work, uh, work in progress, um, and given me and my collaborators a generous deadline here. Um, and this is work together with Gerg Kerlin, uh, Gustav Muggel, and Bram Verbeck. Uh, but let me start with a disclaimer before I get into detail. So uh, this talk is highly motivated by uh, n equals one super young mills multi-loop amplitudes. Uh, however, I will not integrate in this, anything in this talk unless it's a trivial integral. So I will not get to that in this talk. It's too short and we don't, we're not there yet. But um, I will talk about setting up the toolbox um, uh, for the calculation, for the challenges and opportunities of doing n equals one super young mills amplitude at the multi-loop level. I will also, if I get there, I will hope to discuss a new result at two loops for the integrand. Oops. Um, all right, so let's let me start with some motivation uh, that sort of underlies this um, project. Um, so it's well known that if you start a series, in particular n equals one supersymmetry, it's a trade-off between manifesting supersymmetry and using DIMREG. And it, it's a very simple reason uh, the, the reason is that if you have bosons, they typically grow linearly with space-time, whereas if you have fermion, they grow uh, exponentially. And so in general, there's going to be a mismatch in general D. And so if you, if, you, if you use the dimension as a regulator, you're going to have some trouble. Uh, sometimes this is taken as meaning that all supersymmetric theory has this problem. But of course, if you have more than n equals 1, there's always a higher dimensional supersymmetry supersymmetric theory that exists that you can use via dimensional uh, reduction to define uh, dimensional uh, uh, regularization. Uh, but for n equals one, there's a real problem. However, the problem is usually delayed. For example, one loop amplitudes are not affected uh, if you don't count gauge anomalies, which I'm not going to discuss very much. However, at two loops, it's well known that amplitudes typically become scheme dependent. So if you use standard dimensional regularization, which means that you take uh, the space-time dimension to depend on epsilon and the states to depend on epsilon, then you break manifest supersymmetry. But there are other schemes might, which might do better, and I will comment on that. However, in general, I believe the expectation is that for any, dimension, uh, for any dimensional regularization scheme, you will break supersymmetry at some loop order or some multiplicity if you have n plus one. Um, and the way we understand uh, this problem in modern language is that we think of these mu terms. So mu terms are uh, the extra dimensional piece of the loop momentum. Uh, for example, we saw that in, in Simone's talk uh, yesterday. So whenever you encounter these extra dimensional pieces of your loop momentum, you should expect them to break supersymmetry just you know, based on the argument I had on the previous slide. So let's inspect some loop amplitudes just to see whether this is true or not. So let's expect, inspect a one loop integrand that was computed uh, a couple of years ago with uh, Alex and me. Uh, and we're just gonna study this box integral which has matter in, in the loop and externally it's, it's uh, vectors. Uh, this is the only term that actually contains a mu term. Um, so we don't need to look at the other diagrams. Uh, and it actually appears in a very symmetric way. Um, uh, this kappa here are just something that encodes the state dependence. It has a supersymmetric delta function, but otherwise it just keeps track on which multiplets you have on the external legs. Uh, so the mu term is there, uh, but if you try to integrate it, you get zero because mu squared um, is not high enough power of mu to get something, so it's suppressed by order epsilon. And so we see that there's no scheme, depending, scheme dependence in the integrated one loop result but in, there is one in the integrand. Um, but that means that in general, this goes beyond just this simple example. If you look at general multi-loop, sorry, multi-leg amplitudes of one loop, you don't really need a mu term um, to add for, for supersymmetric series, and equals for supersymmetric gauge series. Uh, another thing we can observe in this simple 
uh, result here is actually that it turns out that the new terms is actually supersymmetric because it depends on kappa and kappa depends on delta q. Uh, so it's actually supersymmetric uh, by accident. And the way we can understand that is that this is a matter graph um, and I'm looking here at a long n equals one multiplet in the loop. And that's actually the same as a short n equals two multiplet in the loop. So in some sense, this n equals one amplitude is the same as the n equals two amplitude. And therefore, you know, it has effectively more supersymmetry than, than naively expected. Um, and you can ask, well, what happens if you don't look at matter? What if you look at the vector contribution? And then of course it's gonna be different. Uh, well, not so different. And the reason is that we actually have this interesting identities, which we call one loop supersymmetric decomposition identities. So if you look at the vector in the loop, n equals one vector, we can actually decompose it in terms of an n equals four vector in the loop minus three chiral multiplets in the loop. Uh, these are three chiral long multiplets. Um, and if you do it for n equals two, you see the only thing that changes is this factor of two here. So clearly taking a linear combination of two, this two diagram is not gonna change how much supersymmetry the, the actual answer has. Uh, so uh, even for this answer, you can actually see that there will be mu terms, but it will accidentally also be supersymmetric. Now, if we, if we turn to gravity for a moment here, we can actually notice that we can use the same uh, numerators, same diagrams to describe various different supergravity theories. I'm not gonna go into detail precisely which theories I'm talking about here, but we can just content ourselves by saying that we can square uh, the numerators of the vectors and then subtract out the matter, perhaps. Uh, and now what happens, of course, is that now you start squaring this mu squared and that becomes a mu four. And mu four integrated over the box diagram does not give zero, it gives a finite contribution, right? So you see that even though you don't have to worry about mu terms in the gauge theory, you do have to worry about them in the gravity theory, even when you have supersymmetry. And, and this is well known from early work by Dunbar and Norwich, for example. Um, and, and so in particular, when you wanna use something like double copy or color kinematics duality, you, ha you have to worry about this mu term, even if they don't affect the gauge theory answers, right? So you can see that the super young mills integrand will have some kind of skip dependence encoded by the mu terms, and that can translate to a supergravity amplitude scheme dependence of the integration. Um, I'm gonna just flash some results here at two loops. This is basically some state of the art calculations at two loop going back in the early 2000 and, and all the way up to the late, uh, well, to the 2020, that we're gonna see a talk uh, later on today. Uh, let me just point out this particular calculation by Byrne uh, and, and uh, sorry, by Svi and Lance, and the Freitas, um, uh, where they actually compute the two loop n equals one super young mills amplitude. And I will comment slightly on that on the next slide. I should also point out that there's this work from last year where we compute the full non-planar n equals two super QCD amplitude uh, using similar method as in this talk. And this will actually be useful for the things I'm gonna talk about later on. Um, so let me say something about this calculation from 2002 by Svi and Lance. So they did, they did a calculation both in tooth envelopment scheme, uh, which is uh, you take the virtual gluon states to be two, two minus two epsilon, and that breaks supersymmetry. But they also did it in four dimensional helicity scheme, which keeps only two uh, virtual gluon states. And that actually obeys the SUSE word and this. So I don't know if that's also an accident uh, of the simplicity of the result or whether that's something that can be generalized um, to higher multiplicity at two loop or to higher loops. But as I said, uh, the problem that we're really facing here is that we want to have the mu terms under very a good control because we want to also get gravity results to be correct, right? Uh, so that's something that we did in this n equals two super QCD answer at two loops last year. And the, the way we did it is that we embedded the four dimensional theory into six dimensional theory, which is n equals one comma zero super QCD. And then we have very good control all the way from 4D to 6D. We know that we get all the mu terms correctly, right? But for n equals one, it's not so simple. Um, uh, but let me already give away here a little bit about the punchline of this talk. So n equals one, we're gonna try to cook up some scheme. Um, we're not gonna be able to verify it in this talk because I say we're not gonna do integrals. But the, the basic idea of this scheme is to we're gonna use super, super uh, SUSE decomposition identities and we're gonna use massive chiral multiplets of n equals one. And hopefully we're gonna get something that makes sense. 
Uh, let me also spell out a little bit more what the goals are here in the, in the long term. Um, so we, we're interested in getting mu terms for n equals one, even though it might sound a bit crazy, uh, because how do you define mu terms for n equals one amplitudes? Uh, but what, what we're going to try to do, well, we need to do it is because we want to uh, combine on-shell techniques, on-shell supersymmetry techniques with dim dimensional regularization, uh, because, well, both of these methods has proven to be very good, so we want to combine them. Uh, we also want to use the double copy to get super, super gravity results in dimensional regularization, and we want to get the right result. You might ask, why don't we just do n equals 2 times n equals 0? Well, it turns out that n equals 1 times n equals 1 give different supergravity theories in general than, than n equals 2 times n equals 0, so we ha have to consider both cases. So in particular, we need to consider n equals 1 times n equals 1. And many of this supergravity series, so they have n equals 2 supersymmetry. And n equals 2 supersymmetry can actually lift to higher dimension. You can lift it to 5D, and in some cases, even to 6D. So it's, it's conceivable that if you do the, your calculation correctly, you can lift this 4D results up to higher dimensions. But that requires that you have very good control over these new terms. Uh, so this is a very ambitious goal. And as I said, we're not going to integrate in this talk. So the disclaimer is that we're not going to solve the mu term because unless you have done integration and proven that it worked in a spe specific samples, we cannot, uh, one cannot say for sure whether we solved the problem. However, we will do the only thing that we can do, and that is to try to look at the most general n equals 1 super young mill theory, um, look at the most general integrand that we can get from that, and try to make it compatible with some of the identities that we need, for example, supersymmetry decomposition and color kinematics duality. <clears throat> so for the rest of the talk, uh, I'm going to try to go over these two things. So I'm going to try to go over the formalism for massive n equals 1 super young mills with general superpotential. Uh, I'm going to discuss massive on-shell superspace and discuss some three and four point three level amplitudes, the very basic results and see what kind of massive BCA or color kinematics identities we can find in this theory. And then if I have time, which I hope I will, I will discuss the, the construction of the two loop n equals one super young mills integrand. Um, and I'm basically only gonna talk about the, the massless part or the 4D part, but we're gonna use supersymmetric decomposition and we're gonna phrase things in terms of master numerators. Okay, so uh, what is the most general uh, renormalizable four-dimensional n equals one super young mill theory. That's the theory we want to consider. Well, first of all, we're going to have a massless vector multiplet. It's going to have a, a, a vector and a, a gluino. Uh, uh, so a gluon and a gluino, and then it's going to be a conjugate multiplet here. We can add NF massive chiral multiplets. Uh, in general, they're going to be massive, so we, we assemble them into this long multiplet, which has uh, two bosons and two fermion states. The fermion is going to be a Majorana spinner. In general, we can also include complex masses. So why don't we do that? That can be interpreted as some complex phases in the Lagrangian. And then we said we're going to have a general cubic superpotential, which is compatible with renormalizability. And it typically looks like this. Here, the way I wrote it is, is suggests that I'm working in a joint. But remember that I'm always going to work with color stripped objects later on. So I don't care so much about what representation it is. But of course, you, we can consider the general gauge group representation for the matter. So here we have a general tensor, TABC, which doesn't have to satisfy any particular properties. Well, in this case, it has to be anti-symmetric if it's in the adjoint, but it could be in some other representation. I have already diagonalized the mass matrix, so um, that's not a, a special case that's, that you can do in this case. Uh, so, for example, if I look at the cubic interaction, let's look at three uh, chiral multiplets. I have, a, I have a vector interaction, I have the gluon, and then chiral multiplet interaction, I have three of them. I have color coded uh, the different flavors. So, flavor is color, which is a bit confusing. Um, and then we have self interactions between uh, uh, the different flavor uh, chiral multiplets. Here, actually, there's an arrow here, um, which is a bit misleading because that's actually what happens in the massless case. You have an arrow. Uh, the multiplets are in a complex representation of the flavor group. In a massive case, you can think of flavor group as being real, and therefore you should remove the arrow. Of course, if you have mass, masses, you can break this flavor group further, but uh, that's, that's a minor detail which is not going to play a role here. Um, <clears throat> 
let's look at some special series that we can get. Of course, we can get pure n equals one super diagnosis that's just setting all the matter to zero. We can get n equals one super PCD, which is relevant, interesting because it's close to the real world. This is just setting the, the, this cubic superpotential to zero. We can get something that's called n equals one star super Mills, which is having three adjoint uh, chiral multiplets and setting this uh, self interaction for the cubic superpotential to be an epsilon tensor. So basically, you have an SO3 flavor group. This is a mass deformation of n equals four super Young Mills, which makes it very interesting because it inherits some of the properties of n equals four. <clears throat> then there's a theory here that is a mass deformation of n equals two super Mills, and I'm not even sure if this has a name in the literature. So I just call it n equals two, n equals one double star in this talk, uh, but maybe there is a better name, which I'm not aware of. So this is just a mass deformation of n equals two super Young Mills and inherit, inherit some of the special properties of n equals two. Um, so I should point out that if all this chiral multiplets are massive, then they don't actually have a high, higher dimensional origin. Because if, if there's a higher dimensional origin, you should expect there to be a massless chiral multiplet, which then should uh, behave in the same way as the massless vector, because they need to recombine um, before you push it to higher dimension. But in this case, if all of them are massive, uh, they don't really have an origin. And this means that there is an abstraction to using dimensional reduction approaches. You can also not rely on higher dimensional on-shell superspace. Um, also, you cannot rely on color kinematics duality in higher dimension. Uh, so you have to reanalyze it from scratch uh, using this massive theory. So let's look at some tree level amplitudes. Um, so I'm going to use uh, Niemas and Newton's fancy uh, on-shell superspace. Uh, but I should point out that, that, of course, people have worked on, sorry, spin helicity uh, formalism. I should point out that, of course, many, there's been many papers before that using um, maybe less elegant formulations. But there's been a lot of attempts to formulate a massive version of spin helicity. But I think, finally, we have a very good formulation in terms of this uh, spinners with a little group indices. Uh, so that is what I'm going to stick to. So we do the usual thing here. We just decompose a massive momentum. This is the, are the sigma matrices in terms of a two massless momenta, and we can make the mass dependence explicit. We can also ex expose the little group index, and we can get these massless, sp massive spinners. Uh, the massive spinners in this permutation are very good because they have a smooth massless limit. Uh, we can do something slightly different to what uh, what's been done in previous papers, and that we're going to soak up the little group, in the little group indices as soon as possible, because, well, even though they're nice, they're sometimes uh, a bit annoying as well. Uh, so we soak them up using a Grassmann odd etas, uh, and the original spinners were actually bosonic, so once you soak them up with Grassmann odd etas, you actually get fermionic spinners. And now you can also, you can actually multiply these fermionic spinners in the same way as you multiply massless spinners and you actually get very similar identities. You get uh, basically P slash here, you get a uh, chiral direct trace here. Uh, and some of you might already realize what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm, sick, I'm sort of introducing uh, superspace uh, in a sneaky way. And I should point out that there was, there's been some uh, beautiful papers last year by Aidan Herdenshe and said, Corrent and Timothy Trot, which did exactly this. Uh, so this is highly inspired by their work, although I'm not sure if I'm following their notation uh, very rigorously. Um, but read that paper for very detailed uh, uh, work. So using this uh, fermionic spinners, you can actually now just sum up the, the square angle spinners and you get uh, the Q supermomenta. And you can sum up the angle spinners uh, you also have to do an integration over the eta parameters, and then you get uh, Q dagger. And you can show that this satisfies the n equals one super symmetry algebra for massive particles. Um, and and you can realize that you have one super some one generator which is multiplicative because there's no integration and no no, deriv no, no derivative, and you have one which has an integration. So the multiplicative uh, generator has to appear in the amplitude in, form, in, the, in the form of a delta function. And the delta function can be written out uh, as, as an invariant of this spinner product. Uh, so we, we choose here to work with a holomorphic superspace, which means that it only depends on eta. But you can also Fourier transform to an anti-holomorphic uh, space, which depends on eta bar. And this is just a very simple Fourier transform. 
um, much simpler than when you have more supersymmetries. Um, but if you have many particles, you have to multiply for each particle, do for each particle. Uh, okay. And so we can compute some three point amplitudes. Um, some of this is very closely related by the talk by Yutin, uh, although he was not considering supersymmetry. But you can recognize that some parameter, the famous X parameter that Yutin talked about for a long time, this, this appears here. Um, and we can see it's supersymmetric. Um, and then we can see that this is for the plus helicity vector. There's one for the minus elicit vector. And you can see that these two amplitudes should actually be CPT conjugates of each other. And if you only work in ether superspace, it doesn't look so manifestly, but you can actually do CPT conjugation plus the Fourier transform to see that they are actually equivalent. And X and up downstairs if you do that, whereas it was upstairs over here. You can also consider three chiral multiplets. Uh, the amplitude is a little bit longer, but not too long. Uh, it's actually fully permutation invariant if you don't if you ignore the uh, flavor factor here. Uh, although you can use the supersymmetry to eliminate some of the ethers, which makes it look not so uh, permutation symmetric. One thing to note is that it's not homogeneous in the ethers. This term here is the degree two in eta because this is degree two. This is degree four. So you can see that it has different degrees, and that means that when you take this masses limit, you actually get two different amplitudes. You get one which is all plus chiral multiplets, and you get one which is all minus chiral multiplets. Uh, and in, in general, you can, if you, if you want to work with the massless theory, you can also introduce massless flavor uh, factors here, but uh, let me not discuss that in detail. Let's discuss the um, four-point amplitudes next. So we can actually sew together these four-point, three-point amplitudes and get four-point amplitudes. One has to be a bit careful, because this, this is not, it's not a fancy BCFW, this is just very naive, sewing it together on the factorization pole. Uh, but you can use supersymmetry to say that, well, if you just analyze the result carefully, that should actually be a unique answer. So I do it here for three massive chiral multiplets. It's very simple actually, because most of this eta five does not appear except for in here. And what I have to do is I have to expand out this product and then I can recognize a degree two term I can recognize a degree four term and a degree six term. This actually means um, Fourier transform and that's why it becomes degree six term. Um, and actually I, I didn't, maybe I didn't point out that I'm, oh, I'm using massive, sorry, I'm using complex masses. Um, well, I, I guess I did point that out, but this is why I have an M and an M bar. Um, and you can see that that actually does show up in the amplitude. It's not something that's just, uh, spurious in the Lagrangian or something like that. Um, I can also look at the mass massless factorization pole. That means I have an internal vector. It's actually a little, it's a little bit harder to compute this way, but the answer is actually simpler. Um, and it turns out, well, there's many other amplitudes, but let me just stick to these two guys. It turns out that this expression is actually directly land on BCA numerators. Um, and in particular, it lands on, on BCA numerators for this particular special series that I discussed, n equals one star and n equals one double star. I, I will elaborate on that more slightly. Uh, but okay, so we can, we can analyze the properties for the 4.3 level amplitudes in terms of color kinematics duality. So we can see, for example, the amplitudes that I didn't show you, this one you can, you can get from just starting from 60 super mills and projecting out the appropriate states. You can see that they obey some kind of BCA relations for massive uh, momenta, oh, sorry, massive, yeah, on-shell momenta. Uh, others do not follow from higher D, but they still work. So if, for example, if I look at the enumerator in the vector channel, which was the expression I showed you on the previous result, it looks like this. If I look at the, at the numerator in the Carroll channel, it looks like this, which you also recognize from the previous slide. And you can see, I, I, I can get two Jacobi identities, um, which are not straightforward from higher dimension. So I get this identity involving only vectors. And so you can say that this index up here is the flavor. So you can see that they all have the same flavor. So this is a one flavor identity. Here you see that the phi's actually have different flavors, one and two. There's also an inter internal particle which has flavor three. So this is a three flavor identity. So these are precisely these two series that I mentioned. Uh, we can think of this as bonus relations because they're not actually needed for the double copy to work. They just happens to be there. We don't quite understand why they're there. They're just there. 
Um, in the master's case, you can understand them as being equivalent relations for n equals two and n equals four. But in the master's case, you cannot understand them in that term because you know, well, they're not quite coming from higher dimensions. Um, uh, so if I pictorially show the identities, so I said the, the obvious one or the standard one are these ones here. So that's just the ordinary equilibrium relation, the commutation relation. And we can, we can consider the massless case and the massive case separately. And as I said, the massless case has no arrows. The massive case has, sorry, the massless case has arrows, the massive has not. And this bonus identities is, uh, looks like this in the one flavor case. Uh, so this is the two-term identity, which also shows up for n equals two superangles. But in the massive case, it turns into a three-term identity. And the three-flavor identity is also a two-term identity in the massless case, and in the massive case, it becomes a three-term identity. Okay, so these are the identities we observe. So we actually want to use these identities to look at two-loop numerators. Uh, I should also discuss more the supersymmetric decomposition, because this is critical for the construction. So let's look at some diagrams. Um, this slide maybe is a bit messy, but let's start up here. So let's say that we have com computed n equals two numerator for n equals two super young mills, uh, the double box diagram. We, we can actually try to express it in terms of n equals one building box. So clearly that's gonna be a pure vector contribution and that's gonna be some matter contributions. We can think of the matter as being massive, why not? Uh, and then we can do the same thing if we look at uh, a hypermultiplet in n equals two. We can also decompose that into um, uh, a chiral multiplet and a chiral multiplet with self interactions. And you see that this diagram here is actually the same diagram as here. Well, it's, color is different, but or the flavor is different, but never mind. It doesn't it doesn't matter. It's actually the same diagram. Uh, so it's quite interesting here because now we have various identities and we can try to solve for things. In particular, you notice that we can solve for this guy in terms of this guy and, and these three guys, right? But this guy, we can in turn solve in terms of these two guys. Uh, and this is known This is known from previous calculations. Um, uh, how much time do I have left, David? Nominally minus one minute, but- Okay, uh, uh, let me go maybe one or two minutes more. Can I do that? Yep. Um, yes. Uh, so it turns out that if you, if you solve, there's also similar identities for this diagram because this diagram is more or less the same as this one. Um, so you can see that it's always the same diagram that appears. It's this tree flavor diagram, which has only hypermultiples internally. This is the only unknown graph in this equation system. And this is, this is the, the cool thing about supersymmetric decomposition of two loops is that this is the only diagram we need to compute. And all the other diagrams are just related by uh, supersymmetric decomposition identities. And this, this is true for not just a double box, but for all the other graph topologies that you can imagine. So uh, using this identity plus the Jacobi and commutation identities that I showed you previously, we can work out what are the master diagrams, the master numerators. That means these are the numerators which you can express all other numerators in turn. The, these diagrams might also satisfy various relations between them and, and between themselves, but this is not something that you can solve explicitly. And it turns out that we have four master numerators which have all massive internal lines. And these are the ones. Um, and it's, it turns out that if we can compute them in some way, uh, then it's sufficient to constructing all the other non chiral diagrams in the two loop amplitude. Um, and furthermore, if we are allowed to interpret the masses of this chiral multiplet as being some kind of mu terms or some 60 momenta perhaps, uh, then we have the need in mu terms. However, that's, at this point, it's a bit speculative whether the details work out precisely because we still have to check the, the calculation by integration. I should also say that if you want to get the chiral part, which is the anomalous part of n equals one, you also have to do, get some massless masters, uh, which we did consider. Uh, but that's just for the anomalous part, which you might not care about. We do care about this slightly because it does actually show up in supergravity because of course, if you double copy chiral, the anti-chiral, you get something which is non-chiral. So we have to care about this a little bit, but you can ignore it if you're only interested in gauge theories. Um, here's some details about the ansatz construction, but maybe in the light of the time, I uh, should not discuss it, but you can, you can read here how we constructed the ansatz. The ansatz was non-local a little bit because it had some Mandelstam invariance downstairs but otherwise it was some polynomial in the loop momentum. 
um, we imposed a whole bunch of different constraints. Uh, we had a huge ansatz, and we solved this huge ansatz. We were left with about a thousand free parameters. Uh, we had an even larger ansatz, which had twice the number of free parameters, uh, but we, we solved the smaller one. Um, as you say, that this is for massless numerators, we haven't completed a massive case yet. We expect the massive case to be simpler because the answers is gonna be much smaller, but we had to do the massless case first. It had only finished last week, so we haven't done the massive case yet. Uh, here's some technical details, let me skip that. Let me just go to the summary. So in this talk, I, I, we have begun the study of how massive n equals one super young mills amplitude can be useful for on-shell amplitude program at tree and loop level. And we, we ask a number of questions here. And so far the answer seems to be yes, but I mean, this caveat is that we have not integrated, you know, much, much, more, much more work is needed. We still have to construct the mass, the mu terms. Uh, we computed the BC enumerator for two loop, four vector amplitude and equals one with generic cubic superpotential. That turned out to be the trick because that way we can actually express everything in terms of simpler diagrams. Um, I should say finally that this, if once we have the complete two loop solution, hopefully it should exist, exist, we expect it to exist, but once we find it, it should lead to new, uh, multiple new results in super mills and super uh, via double copy or via supersymmetric decomposition. So stay tuned for further, hopefully integrated results in the future. Thank you. So uh, thanks. Let's uh, actually give a live uh, bit of applause to uh, Henrik. And, uh, let's, um, do people have uh, any, any questions? Uh, so let's start with, uh, with Nima. Hey there, uh, Henry. Uh, um, is there a reason now that you know how to uh, uh, effectively compute these uh, um, amplitudes, uh, these n equals one massive amplitudes, why not use, um, if you want the, uh, I think I, I, I may have missed uh, uh, one bit of uh, motivation, but um, uh, if you want to like regulate your, uh, I mean, you can use the massive theory to regulate the, 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 the massless n equals one theory, if you like, and forget about mu terms, if you start from n equals four upstairs. Or if you want to get a massive n equals one, I mean, I'm just saying, once you have masses in town, you can just use the n equals four to regulate and forget about mu terms and all the rest of it, right? Uh, yeah, that's possible, yeah. I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, I think it's, we're being a bit overly, careful here I mean because we're trying to not only get the right young mills amplitudes I mean that's what you're saying regulating the young mills amplitude but we're also trying to get the gravity amplitudes and uh, you know oh. even more ambitiously even trying to get higher dimensional gravity amplitudes uh, uh, so we, uh, we're I, trying I'm to sorry. be I'm sorry we're trying so to be that, super that the massive that's not obvious at all double copy uh, flat yeah out. we're trying yeah. to be super careful here I, taking, uh, I'm sorry. thank you yeah you're trying to take baby steps so yeah I mean it might in some cases, it might seem a bit um, silly to what we're doing, but we're trying to tread very slowly. Yeah? No, it's fine. I was just confused about with both masses and 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 mu terms at the same time. Because if you if you embed it in the n equals four, you know you won't need the mu terms just for the gauge theory. But I, I see what you're trying to do. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I did maybe go a bit fast. I mean, at some point we're going to try to reinterpret the masses as being mu terms, right? Um, uh, and th that's sort of the goal here, yeah. Uh, Radu? Uh, so one question about the ansatz. Do you have an understanding, an a priori understanding of how non-local you have to make it? Yeah, I mean, th this ansatz that I had briefly flashed here. So this, yeah. this is one over uh, Sij uh, to the third power. And you see that it's the same Sij as the kappa Ij. Mm -hmm. This just means which particles are negative vector states right negative no, what i meant is the third power actually yes uh so this actually we already explored at one loop um mm -hmm. and so we, we 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 carefully went through different possibilities and we found that this was the smallest thing you can do so it always it always turns out to be um let me see four minus the number of supersymmetries so for example uh if you have four supersymmetries then the denominator is just one right uh, and if you have two supersymmetries, the denominator is two. Uh, 
and for QCD, its denominator is four powers, right? So it's it's pretty logical, I guess. Right. Yeah. Uh, are there any further questions? Sorry, maybe just a quick one. Uh, do, you, do you understand the role that these uh, denominators are playing? Uh, well, you can partly think of them as coming from the the gluon polarizations. I mean, of course, that if you if you're trading the gluon polarization for something which is momenta or spinners, then you would expect some kind of non-localities. And so you see that these guys are always connected to the helicity. Um, but I think that's not quite the full explanation. Um, you can also maybe think of it as being uh, they're sort of soaking up uh, various um, bubble graphs and stuff like that. Because if you have, for example, a bubble graph, that would come with more than one. It would be a double pole, for example, right? Um, um, it's like if you have um, this is something we we saw already at at one loop. So at, if you have a one loop bubble graph. I mean, that you would expect that to be one over Sij squared because it has one propagator on each side, right? Um, um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's a full explanation, but this is part of the explanation, I guess, yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's thank uh, again. I have uh, live applause. <laughs>